welcome to the 40th anniversary of the Center for Commercial Studies and our session uh, today on insolvency and uh, game theory. This is a session which is uh, organized by the Institute for Global Law, Economics and Finance. Uh, we are one of the institutes at, at uh, the Center for Commercial Law Studies which uh, combines the legal discipline with the financial discipline and the economic discipline. I am here together with uh, two of my colleagues from the Institute um, and we, amongst the three of us, we cover these different disciplines and we contribute to the teaching, to the research, to the organization of different uh, seminars and events and to the promotion of a discussion between these three disciplines. The Institute was set up a few years ago and we have already organized a number of uh, events in different countries. Uh, all of us at the Institute are involved in uh, different capacity building projects and law reform projects in different countries. The Institute is in charge of uh, the two uh, combined programs in law and economics and law and finance, uh, which as the name would suggest, uh, they include modules from uh, both disciplines. Um, and what we will be touching on uh, today is we will be touching on a, a topic which brings together the two uh, areas and we will showcase how my colleague Rodrigo Olivares Caminal from a legal perspective and my colleague Gary Gabison and I will ask them to introduce themselves shortly from a finance and economic perspective how they will be having a discussion on these issues and how the economic and the legal point of view correlate or diverge when we are discussing um, insolvency. Um, I want to pass on to the co-director of the Institute, to Rodrigo Olivares Caminal, to may introduce himself. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, we are delighted that you are able to join us today and that uh, you are uh, celebrating with us CCLS uh, 40th anniversary, joining our community of alum, alumni and friends. Um, it, it is a great pleasure to share with you that uh, IGLEF, uh, although it's one of the newest institutes that have been established within Queen Mary, uh, as Yanni had mentioned, uh, we have been uh, celebrating several success as uh, some of the projects that we have been involved in advancing research and also helping uh, in shaping policy and law reform. So many of the things uh, we report them on the Institute's website. Uh, but uh, if you have any interest, please feel free to reach out to either Yanis, myself, Gary and the other members of the Institute. I just wanted to, to join Yanis in uh, welcoming you and a big thank you for your time today. Gary, do you want to introduce also yourself and then I will uh, share some logistical issues and then we can actually kick off. Um, sure, uh, so I'm Gary Gabison, uh, it's a pleasure seeing a lot of my students and, uh, and alums. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this talk. I am a member of IGLIF and uh, I worked with those two fine gentlemen trying to uh, save the world one long economic problem at a time. Thank you. I'm very happy. I'm just looking at the chat and I'm very happy because we have Panama, Paris, uh, Grenada, Athens, Buenos Aires, Philippines, Beijing, so thank you all for joining from a quite a diverse number of countries and time zones. For some of you, it's earlier or pretty early. For some of you, it's later. So thank you so much for joining. Just a couple of logistical uh, points from me. Uh, I would be grateful if you could just keep yourselves on mute. Uh, you can have your video on or off, uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, please use the chat 
for uh, any questions. We will start with the discussion between Gary and Rodrigo, and then we will have the Q&A at the end. And welcome to the panel. Thank you. Gary, Rodrigo, over to you. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, I will probably be the one uh, who will take the lead uh, for the introduction. Uh, I assume that basically now you are seeing full screen the slides. So basically, uh, what we are going to be presenting will be game theory in sovereign debt restructuring. And basically, the, the speakers are Gary and myself. And the idea with this set of slides, which is a very short presentation, it's namely two slides, is I will do a very brief introduction, uh, five to 10 minutes, on mapping the sovereign debt landscape. And then uh, Gary will do five, 10 minutes mapping the law and economic theory that underpin some of the issues that are relevant in sovereign debt restructuring. And then what we're going to do, or what we are trying to do, is to have kind of an open dialogue, Gary and myself, uh, me asking him a little bit about, uh, I, I, am, I know the, the legal theory and I know the, uh, how these restructurings are implemented in, in, in practice. So basically, we are going to have kind of an exchange of views, ideas, an open dialogue as to how the restructurings are being done and how the legal theory that underpins some of these restructurings and shape the dynamics uh, can assist or how sometimes they can be uh, will not whether they are up to play the, the role that we need them to do or sometimes where they can undermine our restructuring. Uh, having said that, please do use the chat box. Uh, at the end, Yanis or Christine will, will moderate the Q&A session, so please, uh, it would be useful to have your questions coming across uh, throughout. As, as you know, just as a brief introduction, uh, in the, as a result of the pandemic, which has not uh, left any corners of the globe untouched, uh, there has been an immediate reaction of governments to try to, to on one side, assist its citizenry, and on the other one, uh, finance uh, companies and or employees to keep uh, to try to maintain the status quo in order people not to lose their jobs and in order companies not to go bankrupt as you ha will have seen there has been a an, an immediate reaction from a different a governments temporarily suspending the exercise of certain economic rights and or a, not allowing the triggers for insolvency to be implemented. But that's one of the aspects. But basically on the back of that, many governments have issued a big amounts of debt that a, in some instances they are astronomical. A, and this will trigger some serious debt issues. Uh, that's on the one side. Yeah. On the other side, a, some of these countries a, have a, been experiencing some difficulties ex ante that have been kind of exacerbated as a result of COVID-19. On the back of that, the G20 uh, produced a communique, uh, and this communique is talking about interest payment suspension for a, a big group of countries, and we are now in the phase which this poses certain challenges for implementation, and whether they will be a proper take up by some of these countries. So on the back of that, that's kind of setting the scene. So now let me, let me go now to basically what is the current landscape. And what you see here is basically, a, namely in a nutshell, how fragmented a, the issues are. And, and here, what you see is basically uh, the fact that there's an issue with debt fragmentation 
because basically what you need to look at this is probably draw a, a vertical line dividing, sorry, uh, probably draw a vertical line dividing the issue between uh, here, between what would be a official sector and private sector debt. Uh, in addition to that, uh, what you need to consider or what you need to bear in mind is that uh, what we will be focusing will be in the lower part of the screen where we see, because the, the first uh, four boxes on top, the one that talk about the IMF conditionality, bilateral debt and information sharing, and then when we talk about uh, here about a commercial debt and private sector debt, basically that these are the main contractual terms. This has to do with the incurrence of the debt. So basically what we, what we have here is at the bottom, we have a sovereign debtor, which is experiencing difficulties. And this sovereign debtor needs to relate with either the multilateral agencies, the bilateral lenders, or the commercial lenders. Those that come from the private sector where we have the commercial bank debt, and the private sector debt. Commercial bank debt usually documented through loans and private sector debt usually documented through euro bonds. The problem that we will have here is that what we will have is one single debtor, different creditors and creditors of, of, of different nature. When we talk about different nature is, and that's why basically the, the big main initial classification is official sector on the one hand side and private sector on the other. And when we talk about this official and private sector, then the other element that we have to bear in mind or that we need to consider has to do with a, the universe of separate instruments, which in the case of sovereigns, as, as most of you are aware, sovereigns are, are, cannot go bankrupt. Sovereigns are not subject to any insolvency law. There was some debate as to whether there should be some uh, global uh, kind of initiative to deal with sovereigns when they experience financial difficulties, but there's no such thing as a statutory approach to deal with the degree of indebtedness of sovereign states. As a result of that, what we need to do is more of a piecemeal approach on the different type of debts that we, we come across. Multilateral, bilateral, they are kind of pretty much organized and they have their own set of governing rules and they have their own set of dynamics. A multilateral debt cannot be restructured. At best, it will get rollover, uh, which will have a net present value impact. But then when we move into bilateral, basically this is done namely under the aegis of the Paris Club, an informal group of official creditors, that they are coordinated uh, or they usually are conveyed by the Ministry of Finance in Paris, and they are bound by some guiding principles. Uh, and usually they have to enter into a global agreement and then, then each bilateral lender implements that global agreement or that umbrella agreement uh, specifically to their own claim. And here we have principles of information sharing, comparability, etc. Then when we move into the private sector debt, that's when things get slightly more thorny. Why? Because to start with, you have a commercial lenders. Within these commercial lenders, a, you can have a, a pensioner who has saved all his life savings to and put that money into the bond of a uh, government that now cannot repay their debt, or you can have a, an institutional investor that has billions invested in a bond, or probably a distressed investment fund who, who tries to maximize on return by buying a bond at discount. So the strategies and the dynamics are very diverse. And this is when coordination becomes of the essence. And this is why basically Gary will be talking about the economic theories and we'll be talking about game theory more in particular. But what, how do we deal with this private sector debt? 
mainly the, 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 there's not much out there. So basically there are two main tools to deal with this. One is a, a voluntarily exchange offer, which is a, just an offer. Give me your old document and I will give you a new document. Usually they, they include worth financial and commercial terms. In a nutshell, an extension of a maturity and it can include a reduction on interest or a reduction of, on principal or a permutation of all these three. Uh, the other option is to use the kind of more recent uh, use of CACs, the collective action clauses. These collective action clauses uh, are a tool which has been embedded in the document at the moment of issuance that would allow a predetermined supermajority to agree a modification on the general terms of the instrument. As a result of that, then what if you reach the pre-established supermajority, then uh, that can be uh, imposed on a dissenting minority. And I think that Gary, probably I think that I, uh, I, should, I should park it there unless Yanis tells me that, that, that on the chat box there's any burning question. I think that basically since we lived until the end, I'm not sure if, if questions have been coming in, but uh, I think that, that, I don't know, Yanis, if you have any burning question or if not, I, I, I will there's give no, it over to Gary. There are no questions at this point, but that gives an opportunity to also to uh, encourage our attendees to actually do ask questions in the chat box and we will actually answer them at the end. But there's nothing at this point. So, Gary, floor is yours. Thank you, Yanni. It will also be the clarity in my expression. That's without a doubt. <laughs> Gary, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as Rodrigo explained, uh, we are probably going to see over the next few months a number of countries bailing out and um, and this has been this has been a, a mostly a recent problem by me recent in the last 40 years uh, until then we had this belief that countries could not fail to pay their debt just because the worst that could happen is they start printing more money uh, but you know in the early 80s we had the, the Mexico crisis and and that triggered a wave of um, of issue for uh, bondholders. So since then we've evolved and we've been trying to find a way for countries not to just not repay their debt and say, well, it's fine, we're sovereign anyway, you can't sue us. So they've been coming up with those mechanisms to restructure. So restructuring is beneficial to both parties. So the issuer hopefully will get either an extension on uh, the maturity debt, a lower interest rate, or they might even try to decrease the principal. Uh, alternatively, the bondholder is also trying to recoup some of the funds that were invested more quickly than they would otherwise, trying to go a legal means that usually uh, doesn't provide much recourse. And so the, the, because both tend to benefit, the issue is how do we split that benefit? Uh, so my students already know uh, that in my class, we use a shortcut, we say usually we split the benefit in two. We say we're going to give half the benefit to the issuer and half of the benefit to the bondholder. Um, and the cost theorem tells you that uh, you should come to the efficient outcome regardless of the starting point. However, in reality, that's not really what happens, right? So, um, so because you have with institutional investors, uh, they know it's costly to renegotiate with the government, so they might not want to do it themselves and that may, might wait for somebody else to do it and free ride on their efforts. Uh, but then you might have a minority of bondholders that say, no, no, we don't think the pie should be split that way. We want a little bit more of the pie. And then you might have the bond issuer that say, no, no, uh, we hold all the cards. After all, we could bail and you would get nothing so we should get more of the pie. And so this issue of hold out against hold up 
or hold up and gets hold out, depending on your point of view, if you're viewing it from the bone holder point of view or from the bone issuer point of view, uh, creates friction. So, of course, uh, game theory, uh, so game theory was created uh, in the 40s. Uh, von Neumann, John von Neumann was uh, one of the foremost uh, um, uh, game theorists. And this was created uh, to discuss and to anticipate the movement of, uh, of war allies, particularly during the Cold War. And, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the perennial games that you probably heard about is the prisoner's dilemma, right? It's a, uh, it should be a cooperation game where the two prisoners discuss and agree, but in reality, uh, they don't really cooperate because they cannot discuss. So what happened is they end up uh, choosing an outcome that is not efficient, right? So they ended up, uh, they ended up um, uh, because they're kept separated. So because um, you have one prisoner in one room, one prisoner in the other room, they're offered a plea bargain by the police. And, uh, and because they don't know what uh, their consort did and whether they cooperated with the police, they think that getting a plea bargain would be better and rat out on uh, their, uh, their consort in the crime. However, uh, if they have cooperated and they had agreed not to talk to each uh, to, not to, to talk to the police, they would end up with a better outcome for the both of them. So here we have this kind of situation, except the game is not quite simultaneous, right? We have a sequential kind of game. What do I mean by this is that you have the bond uh, issuer that issues the bond, and uh, the bond issuer is uh, the bond is a legal document. And within the legal document, the contract, there is a series of clauses. And within those clauses, you as the bond issuer, you have control over what is in it. So what you try to do is you try to create a commitment mechanism. You're trying to make sure that okay. I will promise that I will not bail after the fact. And how do I do that? I'm going to include some clauses, right? So some clauses that you might see in usual contracts by the binding arbitration. But a very common clause discussed uh, by Rodrigo a few minutes ago is the collective action clauses. So there are two main kind of collecting action clauses, which are symbol name versus double name. Um, and uh, so the single name say, okay, we need, uh, the government is going to, the, the, the sovereign is going to decide to not repay their debts. And, uh, and we only need 40, 75%, let's say, of all bondholder per value, uh, 75% per value, and, uh, and that's it, right? Uh, and then you have the double name. You have uh, those 75% majority per value, but you will have also 66% of each uh, of each series that were emitted. So as you can see, it's much harder under the double limb to get everybody to agree because if you have a very small series emitted, then somebody uh, might be able to control much more easily uh, those 34% and, uh, and can do that on a repeated number of series. So Sorry, that, can I have just a quick comment here to just to start the dialogue? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we need to bear in mind is that these are kind of the standard super majorities. Mm -hmm. However, this can, the sovereign can vary this, and we have seen that there have been some issues with 85 or even lower thresholds. That's on the one side, but this is kind of the general standard. The other issue is what, and we have seen this recently in, in the Greek case, in, sorry, the Greek restructuring, and that was that is what have triggered this third generation CAC, the one that Gary is referring as a single limb, this is a third generation CAC. And basically what we have seen in Greece is that there were some small issuances that, we, that with a small amount, a, a fund could have created a blocking holding or a blocking position. That was, Gary was referring by holding a 34% because a 34% of a, of a small bond in, in, in investment terms, it's it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it is a lot. And with just holding that, you block the possibility of cramming down, not just your series, but all series, because that was, Gary was referring to the double limb that you need to meet both requirements. While with a single limb, you have some uh, issues that allow you to cram down other bonds in their entirety. Oh, thank you, Rodrigo, absolutely. Thank you for, for this clarification. 
so as you can see, it becomes a little more complicated. And, uh, and so uh, here, what you do is you, you try to anticipate the problem, but no contract is perfect because the perfect contract would have to anticipate that there's going to be a pandemic, that there's going to be a war in country X, and it's going to affect your economy. And the perfect contract does not exist. So we have to stop at some point because the cost of including more clauses and trying to anticipate the contract is not worth the benefit because the probability of that occurring is just very, very small. And, and so, so you include those clauses and, and, and while they're great, they create their own problems, right? So Rodrigo was talking about the ability to, uh, to be able to, uh, to hold up the bond holder, uh, the bond issuer and say, no, no, we need you to give us a little more of the benefit. So there is no real great uh, solution, right? It's gonna be on a case by case basis. It's gonna be depending on the country, on, uh, on, uh, on what you expect was going to happen. And, uh, and what also uh, really matters is also what, so what you include in the contract will attract different kind of bond holder, right? And so here you have a matching game. So, um, so John Nash, who became very famous uh, uh, because he came up with the Nash Equilibrium and who won the Nobel Prize in 1981, in 91, uh, came up uh, with a solution and said, all those games have at least one solution. And I'm going to call it the equilibrium. The equilibrium is where uh, nobody can do better by trying to deviate alone. Those are in reality very rare to, 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 to come up with. And, uh, and even you might have different kind of equilibrium and, uh, and you might reach one, not be able to reach the other. In economic jargon, this is called a sunspot. Uh, why do you get one and not the other? Sometimes it depends on where you start from. And where you start from is, uh, is also this relationship between the bond as the document and who you are attracting. And here you have a matching game, right? So here as an institution or as an investor, you can say, okay, this is my preference for risks. This is my preference for return. And I'm gonna try to find the investment that matches my risk and return the best and, and try to, to find that investment. Of course, that investment might not exist at all. And, uh, and trying to cater to the greater population is very complicated. And trying to offer that kind of uh, risk and reward uh, combination is very complicated. So that's why when you have this restructuring and this renegotiation, you still have to convince people that, okay, I'm gonna give you what you want. But if you are changing the game on me, I might not be interested, right? And so if I know you as a player, as an issuer that you tend to change the game after the fact a lot of the time, you might not be willing to invest. The people you're gonna attract are gonna people who might be more interested in holding out and trying to get a little bit more of the game. So here you might get an adverse selection problem, right? And so here, those clauses and particularly those collection, uh, collective action clauses create this distorted incentive both on the issuer side and also on the bondholder side. Um, so uh, Rodrigo, back to you. Thank you, Gary. I, I personally think that basically I suggest Yanni probably open it to, to the Q&A session. Um, uh, but uh, if not, I think, that, I think that probably the best thing would be to open it to the Q and A. Uh, I don't know. I've not been. I was on the presentation mode. So I've not been able to follow the chat. Uh, I don't know whether some questions have came in. If not, I will. I will start. I have, I have a question to ask uh, both of you. We don't have any questions yet, but please feel free to to ask questions. Rodrigo, in your opening remarks. Uh, you made the point, and correct me, that it's clear, and I will put clear in inverted commas, it's clear that sovereigns cannot really become insolvent. And, and correct me if I am misrepresenting the exact nature of your comment. But listening to Gary, from Gary, I get the impression that even though we may have a legal doctrine, and I will get pass on to Rodrigo to tell me whether I'm correct. 
even we have a legal doctrine which is sovereigns cannot actually default because of the game because of of a game and, and the game theory perspective that stakeholders and actors need to take into account or when they will be doing a negotiation with IMF or whoever else, at the end, you may have a sovereign which will need to default just because they will have got it wrong on the game theory from. Am I seeing it accurately? It's, maybe I am not, so both of you, if you can just tell me whether my understanding from, from the combination of your uh, points is on, is on the right track. Okay, Yanni, basically this is a deep philosophical question. And uh, for me, uh, a sovereign cannot go insolvent. And I'm going to explain to you why a sovereign cannot go insolvent. Because basically the first question we need to ask ourselves is how do we understand insolvency? If it's a legal definition or it's a financial notion. From a legal point of view, a sovereign cannot go insolvent because to start with, there's no a bankruptcy law or insolvency law that the sovereign can be submitted. So basically there's no overarching regime or there's no authority that can uh, declare a sovereign bankrupt. So basically from a legal point of view, insolvency laws will not apply. Okay. So that's why then we need to move into the economic notion of insolvency. And basically, if we think of insolvency as a, a government not being able to play, pay its debt when they fall due, that's what you were referring at default, or liability exceeding the value of the assets, let me start by saying again that these definitions come from an insolvency law. What is the, the template? What is the bar to understand uh, whether a government is insolvent or not, again, the two tests, which are the balance sheet test and the liquidity test, these are tests that come from the insolvency law, the insolvency mm -hmm. act. Uh, and that's why basically this is kind of a, a catch-22 dilemma. But let's focus on, on the financial condition. I'm sorry if I'm taking longer, but it's, it's, we need to build kind of these building blocks to understand the notion of insolvency uh, for sovereigns. So the reality is that uh, assets exceeding the value, uh, sorry, liabilities exceeding the value of the assets, in the case of the sovereigns, I personally think it's uh, very difficult to, to, as a condition to, to be met. Why? Because sovereigns have, I would say, uh, very strong powers. They can start by uh, taxing its citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, you can come in and probably Gary will we'll talk about the Laffer curve where basically increasing taxes at some point becomes inefficient. And for example, we can talk about the case of Iceland uh, during the, the European debt crisis. Uh, Iceland with 300,000 uh, inhabitants, uh, let's take out those that are under 18 that do not pay taxes. Let's take out those that have retired that are not paying taxes either. So that gives us a, a, even a smaller taxable pool. But if taxes are not sufficient, uh, which that might be the case in several other countries, then technically they can dispose of assets. Okay. They, they can do privatization, privatizations. And eventually, I'm not suggesting this, we live in the 21st century, but uh, France sold the state of Louisiana to the US to pay for its uh, Napoleonic Wars. Uh, I don't know why Gary is laughing. Uh, he holds kind of both nationalities, so... I don't know which side he is, but anyway, uh, but basically that, that's an exa a historical example. Uh, I don't think that that's a concept of the 21st century, but eventually a sovereign can expropriate assets. Okay. L let me al allow me to stop you there to go to Gary. We have also a few questions on the chat just to keep the discussion flowing. Gary, over to you to answer my question. No, no, I think, I think your, your question is absolutely valid. I am... Um, so can a sovereign go bankrupt? I would say yes. Uh, we've seen it over the years. Uh, do they usually go bankrupt? Probably no, as, as Rodrigo eloquently said, you know, you can always tax your citizen a little more and or you kick the bucket down the line and 
and get a new bond out to pay back the first bond and then uh, keep doing that forever, right? So uh, you're kind of, because you're an entity that lives forever, it's really rare to see uh, this happening. That's why when, um, uh, when Mexico did it, everybody was flabbergasted. Uh, but so can it happen? Yes. Does it usually happen? No. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on to the uh, question that we have from our attendees. Uh, we have one in relation to the situation in Sri Lanka. What is the speaker's take on the situation in Sri Lanka? And whether you think that game theory has, what would game theory tell us about how that situation may, may evolve? If we can keep our answers to three, two, three minutes, uh, it would be great just to allow, we have a few more questions to allow a fluid discussion. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, Rodrigo, you want to, oh, Gary, Rodrigo, uh, who wants to take it first? Okay, I'll go first then. Um, I mean, so the situation in Sri Lanka is just like most countries where that is spiraling out of control. Um, what does game theory tell you? Well, it's, it's hard to tell uh, whether there is something specific about Sri Lanka, but you know, a lot of countries like Sri Lanka, what is usually happening is that uh, you have to seek people to, to seek funds outside of your country, right? So you're going to go and emit bonds, but the bonds are going to be held by foreign, uh, by foreign investors. And that creates a problem because usually foreign investors have this issue that they don't know the country as much. They don't have that self-interest as much. Uh, they really don't care whether your country is going to do well or, or bad. They just want their, their investment to flourish. Right. Whereas if you have home investors, they have interest for the country to do well. So here you're attracting a specific kind of investors and those type of investors tend to be the more li most listed one. They're going to be the one who's going to ask for a bigger part of the cake. So, uh, so I would say here what you can learn is really that you, uh, by Increasing your debt constantly, you're going to have to increase your interest rate constantly, but you're also going to attract a specific kind of investor who are going to be the one pushing you to your limit further and further. If, if I can add just mm -hmm. there briefly on, on the students in Sri Lanka, and it's nice to hear from Nipuni, a former student. Uh, the latest I've heard is basically, or, or one of the, the salient issues in Sri Lanka is that in Sri Lanka, they are one of, of the new uh, big players in bilateral lending, which we are seeing that also extensively in Africa and to a certain extent in Latin America, because traditional bilateral lenders used to be those under the aegis of the Paris Club, and now we are seeing some new entrants into the arena. But uh, I'm not necessarily saying that this is a, the convenient way forward, but basically what we have seen is a some restructuring where they basically they, they was a swap of debt for exploitation rights on certain of the the key assets of of the government which was basically linked to a concession for 99 years i guess if i'm not mistaken okay, thank you i suggest i move on to the next uh, question and, and i know there are a few questions but i cannot see all of them so i have to go down as i see them on the chat i apologize uh, so the next uh, question we have relates to arbitration clauses and why have an arbitration clauses made it into contracts as it might be a proxy to an insurance regime. And uh, is it about sovereignty? Uh, if it is so, subjecting the sovereign to foreign courts would be giving up some of the sovereignty. So let me start with Rodrigo this time and then move on to Gary. Thank you, Yaris, and thank you, Jorge, for, for the question. Uh, we have seen uh, some arbitration clauses in some sovereign debt contracts, rarely though. Examples are Brazil or Kenya. Uh, the issue is that I, I don't see this much different from the go uh, governing law and jurisdiction clauses that you see nowadays in these contracts, because at the end of the day, arbitration is just another means of resolving a dispute. And the reason why uh, these arbitration clauses have, have not necessarily become that popular is that a couple of things. One is 
uh, arbitration uh, so far is an uncharted territory or not as uh, trailed as a litigation in, in a court of law. Uh, so basically in sovereign debt litigation, there are many precedents, uh, both in, in London and New York, I would say probably more even in New York, and creditors who are the ones who choose how disputes are going to be uh, resolved. Usually when you lend at the negotiation of the contract, it's the lender who sets the terms. And they are, they are relatively comfortable with how courts have been resolving these issues because of the sanctity of contracts and, and how courts have been interpreting these debt obligations of a sovereign. And also the other element there is that uh, courts facilitate the quick attempt to attach assets if needed. Thank you. And Gary, over to you. Oh, that's fine. I was brilliant. Ah. I have nothing to add. Thank you, because now you're also allowing for the next question, which I will start with you then. Um, let me... Uh, so, uh, we have a question from uh, Mariano. Uh, what are the mechanisms that come into play to balance the game on both sides once a holdout problem has been established? And the example he gives is a large investor triggers a collective action clause. So, let's start with Gary, if you have any views, and then Rodrigo. Uh, over to you. I mean, from, from a gear, game theory point of view, usually, um, so uh, holdout problems are, and holdout problems are not solved very easily. So usually uh, you will keep negotiating as long as you think the benefit that you can extract are going to be greater than the cost that you're incurring in keeping, have, you know, you still have to pay lawyers to go and negotiate, right? So you have to pay uh, and so as, as long as you think that you can extract a little more, that might be worth it, you're going to keep going. At some point, you're just going to give up and accept whatever deal is on the table because you still need to recoup something. So as, an in, as a bond holder, that, that is your imperative. Uh, as the issuer as well, you're probably going to try to hold out as long as possible, as long as you think that uh, if you can hold out, people are going to get tired and because your entity is infinitely lived, why not? Why not do this? So there is, there is, there is back and forth, and really here is, uh, there is no real easy solution uh, because courts, even if they have a voice, uh, they might not be listened to. Okay. Uh, the only thing that I will add there, uh, Yanis, uh, is the following. Uh, for me, it's all about uh, what I refer as sweeteners. These are contractual sweeteners, things that you can do to, to make the contract more appealable. And some of the alumni who are present in this chat will, will relate to the example that I'm going to give. Usually what you are asking someone is to exchange, let's say, a Ferrari, and in exchange you're giving them a Fiat Cinquecento or a bicycle. So why would you trade a car for a bicycle? Uh, and they, uh, because basically that's the reality. I owe you a hundred. Now I'm going to pay you fifty. I owe you a hundred tomorrow, and I'm going to pay you fifty in twenty or thirty years from now. And and again, if you are a pensioner who has invested all your life savings, probably you will not see the fruits of that. So, and that's why that's why you need to be more creative. And that's why by adding some contractual sweeteners, that means other clauses that makes it more appealable. Like for example, if you default again the haircut that you accepted will be reinstated. Or throughout the life of the new bond, the sovereign needs to start buying throughout the life some of the outstanding bonds to make the whole issuance more manageable by the time it matures. These are just some examples. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are many more, but I'm conscious of time. Thank you. And before we move on to the next question, I, I will need, unfortunately, to, to jump on, on another engagement I have, but uh, my colleague Christine Stokes from CCLS will uh, take over, and I would like to first thank Christine for actually organizing this event for us. Thank Rodrigo and Gary on my behalf for actually uh, participating and explaining difficult concepts. All of our attendees, and I see we still have a very high number of attendees, we have not lost any attendees. Um, until now, so thank you all for, for being here. I will need to go. Uh, I, I would like to wish a nice summer vacation 
uh, to whoever can take uh, summer vacation uh, in the next few weeks. If not, uh, stay safe and uh, we will uh, hopefully be in touch virtually or ideally face to face sooner rather than later. Thank you. Great. So uh, I'm just going to move on to a, another question. We've got one from Duran. He said, uh, considering the statement that Sovereign is a non-bankruptable -bank contracting party, what would be the remedies of breach of contract by the Sovereign? Within this context, what would be the risk mitigation measures the other party may request to avoid future breaches? So, Rodrigo, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, thank you, Christine. Uh, Duran, nice to hear from you. Hope uh, all is fine at your end. Uh, Duran, this is a Okay, where do we start? This is a, a two-hour question at best. Uh, let me see how we can summarize it. The, the reality is that uh, sovereigns are a special kind of creature, and probably I can, I can give you an answer that probably we can drag Gary into the answer as well. Uh, sovereigns as such, uh, as the name indicates, they are sovereign, and they have some sovereignty, and they have some sovereign powers. The issue is that, uh, and that's why it relates to what I was uh, commenting about uh, Jorge's question, uh, Jorge Pedraita from New York, when I were, we were discussing about the issue of uh, arbitration clauses. In a court of law, it would be very, relatively easy to get a fa favorable court order because it would be very simple. The, the judge will say, have you borrowed the money? Yes. Have you paid the money back? No. Okay, then why are we wasting our time? The issue will come afterward when you will have to try to enforce that court decision. Because again, most of the assets will be within the borders of the sovereign, and the sovereign has a, another fascinating tool, which is a lawmaking machine, which will probably can pass uh, either an executive order or or a law stating that due to the state of emergency, due to the state of necessity, uh, you cannot attach any government assets for the next year, and then probably they extend that for another year. So what we need to think here is that basically the, the issues basically that help this mitigation comes again from Gary's side of the equation, which has more to do with the economic literature. And here we have issues on reputational costs and eventually uh, trade costs. The economic literature on that particular aspect is not entirely in agreement as to how this will work. But for example, we are seeing now uh, Argentina, which has entered a, a new default, and basically Argentina's borrowing cost, basically the interest rate that uh, lenders are charging Argentina, it's 6.3 plus, let's say. While Chile, for example, uh, it's borrowing at 3.3%. So uh, here we go into some of these reputational costs and the remedy. It's not a remedy per se, but the things that they try to avoid. As to the remedies, it basically, what I was telling you is, building better uh, contracts. Uh, and I would say then we go down into the usual remedy that you will try to put in place in any lending arrangements. Uh, some of the things that we are starting to see now as well in the sovereign arena, which we have, uh, which is not very common, are financial covenants as well. Uh, debt to GDP ratio that should not go above X, for example. I, I try to run. I try to be as as succinct as possible because, uh, as I told you, I start with this disclaimer. It's a kind of a two-hour answer. Otherwise, wonderful. I have I have nothing to add. As always, <laughs> Rodrigo is so eloquent. I, I I'm speechless. Great. Okay. Um. So Thomas Dillon asks: A sovereign can become insolvent in the sense of having no money. But if we mean bankrupt in the legal sense, there is no legal regime to take over its assets and distribute them to creditors. So more of a comment there. It, it, more of a statement, but Thomas, basically, uh, when does the state run out of money? And, and again, it's a silly example, but, but this proves the point. 
Greece, for example, Greece has more than 3,000 islands. Greece, uh, well, technically Greece never defaulted, but any of these countries, if you, if you just sell a tiny piece of land, I mean not in commercial value, but in geopolitical uh, value, uh, I, I, I tend to disagree because basically it's not that they run out of money because technically they can print money, we can discuss about inflation, they can expropriate assets from its citizens, we can discuss about social unrest, but, but the notion from a theoretical point of view that the sovereign can run out of money, I, uh, I do not share that entirely, but uh, I, I respect your, your take on that. Okay, should we do the last question then? Yeah, so we've got one question from James, and this is the last one unless anyone sends anything in now. Uh, the elephant in the room, game theory of any use in bilateral debt negotiations with non-Paris club lender. Gary, I will, I will frame this to you and I will, I will leave the <laughs> game theory element to you. But basically, I assume that James is referring to what we are seeing with the non-conventional bilateral lenders that uh, they are growing uh, in, but basically we are seeing a lot of these bilateral loans of non-Paris club members. The Paris club is a group, an informal group of creditors. It has, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 22 permanent members, but now we are seeing bilateral loans. And, and I think that, that was what Nipuni was referring to before. We have a China lending extensively at the bilateral level, Saudi Arabia as well and others. And these are not permanent Paris Club members. So let's assume a, an African country with a, a bilateral loan from China. This bilateral loan amounts to approximately 50% of the total outstanding debt and the other 50% is commercial debt. So basically, I guess that what James is referring here, uh, Gary, is how this, if game theory can help in the dilemma. From, if you want, I can add from a legal point of view, basically what we will have here or the, the stick in, in a legal strict sense will be that we are dealing with two sets of debt obligations. One is official, the other one is private. Uh, and the official is uh, discussed at bilateral level because basically bilateral lending is a done for uh, not necessarily commercial purposes and then the commercial loans and, and for commercial loans you will probably have resort to the courts. Uh, we can discuss if you want that, the, that in these bilateral loans in some instances they are also subject to the courts which uh, it's not that common and then we will see that some of those courts are even the court of one of the two parties involved in the lending arrangement but uh, I think that probably there's no need to overcomplicate this for now unless there's need to get deeper. But Gary, I don't know if you want to add something on the on the game theory element there. So, I mean, I have a firm belief that game theory can explain most of the world. So uh, I would say yes, even if, you're, even if your counterparty does not want to negotiate, doesn't want to sit down or is not part of this kind of um, negotiating apparatus, you have resources and you have uh, things that are available to you to force negotiation. So we haven't seen those in a, in a long time, but you know, in the 1800, um, the debt between Spain and the, in England uh, led to a war. And so you might have this kind of retaliation, uh, maybe not as common nowadays, but you will have different kind of commercial retaliation. So for instance, uh, if um, you know, uh, anything goes by, um, if you have any financing going through a country such as the US that might have jurisdiction over your assets, they might be amenable to help you try to uh, deal with a country that is not willing to negotiate. Right? So uh, that's what an economic embargo is, uh, and you have uh, sanctions as well, right? So if China was, uh, for instance, uh, was the holder of a bond with country X, and country X refuses to, uh, to repay its bond, and refuse to sit down and negotiate. China does have things available to them. They can create an economic embargo. They can have economic sanctions. And, and those are different apparatus. Most countries are not usually going to want to get involved 
right? But it is an option. But have in the past in different situations gotten involved if the assets of their citizens are threatened. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I think that probably uh, we should just wrap it up. I would just add there a small comment, which is at the end of the day, uh, what we need to consider, what we need to bear in mind is that there are very, very limited assets which are usually held uh, abroad. And those that are held abroad, then they are, it's very difficult to have a right to attach or action on those assets because most of them will be protected by international treaties or by a uh, sovereign immunity, uh, like for example, embassies, consulates, military assets, payments to and from the IMF, central bank reserves. So if we uh, remove these assets, then there's very little that you can really attach outside the border. There have been several attempts, uh, some of them fascinating, like even going after satellites, but uh, other than that, it's, it's very limited what the sovereign really has beyond its borders. Right. Um, okay, I didn't mean like, I mean, yes, but you can also still affect the citizen of that country as well, right? So if your, your citizen are being harmed, right, you might have a different negotiate, negotiating approach with other countries, right? So if, for instance, um, you know, country X doesn't want to negotiate and repay the citizen of China. China will not have any FDI and might threaten to not send any goods to country X. And, and this is, you know, an economic embargo. I don't mean, I mean, you, yes, the, the assets are limited, but there's still other things that you can do. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, now, nowadays, nowadays, this... Uh, this kind of so I'll, give you the, so I'll give you the example of the US and Iran, right? So I know it's not linked to bonds, it's linked to uh, military problems, right? But the US froze Iranian assets in the, in the US and, uh, and that created a problem for Iran. They created an economic embargo, uh, whether it's effective or not, it's a different discussion, uh, but you do have an impact, right? So. There is, uh, there is a big, uh, there is a political issue around what happened between Ven uh, what happened in Venezuela and the U.S. Uh, not uh, trying to do a similar approach to Venezuela, but not being as um, as um, heavy-handed as they were uh, as they as they were with Iran. But the U.S. did some things that were of that essence that were linked to political action, military action, right? In the past, and I'm not saying in current, their current examples, but in the past, this has had happened where it has led to, to difficulties. Just uh, let's talk about, you know, the bond between the US and the UK post-World War II. Uh, I mean, it was a loan, however you want to call it. Um, and who, you know, it took almost 60 years to repay. And, uh, and then there was the uh, Suez Canal incident and the U.S. disagreed with what was going on in the Suez Canal. And the U.S. did not hold back when they say to the U.K., either you comply or we're going to make your financial situation difficult, right? So there are different mechanisms. That's, that's all I meant. I don't mean that, <laughs> you know. Well, Gary, I... I... Uh, I think that basically the Venezuelan example is it's a good one. I think that probably in Venezuela we have some very peculiar circumstances. Other than that, I, I, I see it difficult, but it's something which is on the table. We cannot discard it completely. Okay, I think that probably uh, since we have no more questions, I think that probably we should uh, be wrapping this up. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity once more to thank you all for joining us today it was very very enjoyable to see some alumni to see uh, other friends of the house who have joined on this webinar and basically both gary and myself um, are happy to continue the conversation either by email or 
at IGLEF level with any one of you, uh, either myself, Yanis as co-directors, Gary, or any of the other members who were not able to join us today. But basically, happy to to continue this conversation and to have an open uh, channel of communication related either to this webinar or to any other issues where there's an interaction between law, economics, and finance. Thank you, everyone. I don't know, Gary, if you want to, to add anything else. As always, wonderful. Thank you.